I'm going to open the floor to questions. Uh, we have about 15 minutes and then uh, both Gordon and the Minister will have to leave. So um, if we could start the ball rolling, I think we have two microphones roving around the, the, uh, the room. So can we, can we any questions? Yes, yourself here. Have we a microphone here? I think it's Mary, is that right? Yeah. Good morning. Mary O'Dowd from the Institute of Community Health Nursing. And I want to congratulate the Minister on the tremendous work she has done in bringing this agency in Gordon with his involvement as well. However, I'm a little concerned if we, any of you that have read the task force report, where um, public health nursing um, is recommended as a priority to transfer into this new agency. So I'd like to ask the Minister um, why we're not in phase one. I understand when I've asked before that we'll be in phase two. The logic of this, if we're talking about children, is the public health nurses, the minister said, 84% are seen within 48 hours of coming home. In fact, a lot of them are seen antenatally as well. And if we're talking about prevention, intervention, early, all the evidence, it's all in the books, it's all in the reports, surely public health nursing should be in phase one. So I'd like to ask the minister why, why I understand there's a good reason, but to date I just haven't been able to determine that. Thank you. Can we take another, say, two questions and then we'll, 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 we'll ask the panel to respond. Yourself here, yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, Michael Barron from uh, Belong to the National LGBT Youth Service. Um, and this question is for Gordon Jays. Is this microphone working? Yes. Yep. Oh, great, yeah. thanks. Um, I just wanted to ask Mr. Jays um, what role equality might play in the rights-based approach of the new agency because as well as socioeconomic disadvantage, certain groups of young people, such as LGBT young people, young travellers, young asylum seekers in particular, are at a particular risk in Irish society at the moment and could do with greater emphasis on the uh, positive discrimination that Mr. Jay speaks of. So I'd just maybe like him to talk about what role equality will play in the new agency. Okay, thank you. Thank you. And one, one last one. The lady over here with her hand up. Yeah. Hi, good morning. Just want to say congratulations to both the Minister and um, Mr. Jays. My name is Fiona Ryan. I'm the Director of Alcohol Action Ireland, the national charity for alcohol-related issues. And I was glad to see that um, Mr. Jays, obviously having worked in Scotland, will be familiar with the hidden harm um, action plans and strategies that exist in Scotland and Northern Ireland. And obviously the Minister referenced the fact that one in seven kids are in care because of parental substance misuse issues. So I was just wondering... I guess in light of the new agency and in light of a potential announcement around the National Substance Misuse Strategy next week, and we know the Minister's interest in um, substance misuse issues, is there a plan to, um, I guess, focus on something like a hidden harm strategy for the Republic of Ireland, similar to Scotland and similar to Northern Ireland? Okay, thank you. Maybe we'll, we'll pass over to the Minister. Minister, would you like to take some of those questions? Okay. Thanks very much indeed. Well, Mary, uh, the first thing I want to do is, is welcome uh, your enthusiasm uh, for the agency and for the role of public health nursing uh, within it. Uh, we did take the decision in the first instance to move ahead with the Child and Family Support Agency, the Education uh, Welfare Service, the Child Protection Services of the HSE, uh, the various uh, services in relation to domestic and gender violence and uh, community psychology. And it really was a question of, uh, uh, you know, uh, dealing with the very broad uh, legislative uh, challenge of doing that. Um, it doesn't mean that right now, immediately, we shouldn't have the kind of engagement with public nurses uh, that is, as you rightly say, uh, so invaluable. Um, but it was really a, a practical question of uh, what we could effectively do in a short and immediate time frame um, but I do want to assure you that I do see public health nursing as being very uh, central to the development of the kind of quality services uh, that we want to deliver um, and clearly uh, there will be negotiations with other departments in relation to that um, there are boundary issues that have to be examined obviously uh, they arise in relation to, uh, to some other professional groups as well 
and uh, we're in negotiation in relation to that. So it, it really was just a, a practical issue of, you know, we, we have to start the agency, we'll deal with the agencies, uh, the three agencies in place, bring them together and some other services, and then move on uh, to, to fulfil as much of the vision of the agency uh, as outlined in the task force as we can. Uh, but certainly, uh, in the meantime, I think that question of professional interaction and sharing of information and working centrally with the public health nurses is really critical. And I have to say, I'd, it's easy to talk about interagency work. It's easy to talk about professional sharing. But we actually have a long way to go. You know, when I sit down with groups, whether it's groups in working in mental health or community psychology or child protection, you know, I'm constantly amazed at the challenges that are still there in relation to professionals working well together. Um, and at a time of, you know, difficulty in resources, I, I, it's even, it's more difficult than, you know, one can, uh, one can um, you know, accept how difficult it is. But I think we've, we've a lot of work to do on it and, and to really begin to do the kind of interprofessional work uh, that we saw in the child death report, for example, needed to be done. And, you know, any ideas that people have in relation to that or, you know, models that we have where it's working well, I think we really do need to, to share and, and, and develop. I think there's, there's a lot of work to be done uh, in that whole area. Uh, Michael, obviously you raised a point in relation to equality. Obviously it has to be at the heart of the ethos of, of the agency. Yeah, no question about that. National alcohol policy, well, uh, I feel very strongly about this, that it's time at a national level, at a government level, that we did away with what has traditionally been the approach to alcohol in this country from a, if you like, from a legislative, maybe a government point of view has been, uh, you know, and we know that uh, the approach to, in, to alcohol in Ireland has been one of ambivalence, and that's often been reflected in, in government action traditionally. We've been ambivalent about our approach uh, to the industry. I think the damage is so great to individuals, the damage, uh, the, the costs are so great uh, that the time, you know, for ambivalence is gone uh, in terms of government policy. And my colleague, um, Minister White, will be uh, unveiling the national alcohol policy soon. And you're right that we have to integrate good practice in relation to alcohol in all of the work of the Child and Family Support Agency. Um. Obviously, I just want to pass brief comment on the first bit. Obviously, I support all the recommendations of the task force, but there is an issue of sequencing given the, all the changes that are going on in the health service. Families don't work in boundaries, so we need to get those relationships right. There are no boundary solutions, so we need to make sure that we stay in step to some extent so that we're working collectively together in the needs and interests of children and families. With regard to equality, I think it's an important question and you need to keep raising it. I would expect to have equality audits. I think we've made improvement in some areas such as our services to unattached children. I think the approach to traveller children uh, you know, needs to be identified more. We need to adopt different approaches. We need to make sure that irrespective of the intention, if the consequence of a particular approach or a particular policy is to discriminate, then we have got to seek to change that. The Minister mentioned that one of our problems has been data poor. All places can be like that. I remember my first challenge in Cambridgeshire was the leader wanted to send a Christmas card to every child in care in the county. And uh, by the second year, we were able to do it easily, but it took a lot of doing. It was an interesting challenge. Not yet. Um, <laughs> um, no, no, never give this minister challenges. <laughs> you know, but, but the issue I'm mentioning is because Ireland are still far too reticent about wanting to register ethnicity. And without that data, you know, we, have, you know, we need that in order that we can go the extra mile and know what impact our services are having and that we don't regularly um, 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 amass that information. I've, um, I spoke at a conference in Derry last year about alcohol action. I'm well aware of hidden harm. I'm not promoting any particular initiatives. There's a range of initiatives across, but certainly we need to have 
cross-cutting action. Alcohol, probably more than any other subject, affects every department of government, whether it be trade or industry or tourism or the damaging effects on health or on social consequences. And we need, the Minister's made this point, to take the debate beyond hypocrisy, where too often it gets stuck. OK, we can take probably three more questions very quick. Uh, yes, down here at the back. Uh, thank you. Conor Fottrell is my name. Um, I'm a solicitor working in this area. And I just wanted to clarify or ask just for clarification in relation to an issue that both of you addressed in your talk. And that was in relation to the court process and the reform of how these cases are dealt with. Um, and I suppose as somebody who has practiced in this area in Dublin uh, and is now outside of Dublin, uh, in Dublin where you have specific our designated courts sitting on a daily basis, perhaps up to three courts sitting on a daily basis to deal with these cases. The difference in how the cases are dealt with outside of Dublin is quite extraordinary. And I suppose I can just give you an example. I was in a court uh, last week where there were 68 cases in a district court list, um, in a family court list. Of those three were child care cases or HSE cases. Two of those cases involved issues that needed to be aired before the court. And we, were, uh, we arrived in court at 10 o'clock and we got on at about quarter past four. You have uh, social workers, two social workers. You had a guardian at Eton, legally represented, solicitor on behalf of the HSE, and two solicitors for both parents. And when we got into court, and it's no dis uh, criticism of the judges, in fairness, they have extraordinary lists to be dealing with it, but we had about 15 minutes to air the issues. And it's a most unsatisfactory way the cases are dealt with. And I'm just wondering... As I said, I know you both referred to this system. I'm just wondering if you clarify or elaborate a little bit on what the plans may be to reform this process. As it is a, something that needs to be addressed. It really is um, quite unsatisfactory, particularly as outside of Dublin. Okay, t thank you. Um, the lady just in front there, her hand up yet? And I'll come to you, Ms. Chaplin. Just very briefly, Catherine Gant, Solicitor, I welcome a lot of um, what has been said. Just very briefly to Mr Jay's, um, no other government agency use senior counsel as a matter of routine in the High Court. No other government agency sends senior counsel to the District Court. And just to explain, if you have a senior counsel in a case, you also have to have a junior counsel and a solicitor. I've run cases in the High Court as only a solicitor where the legal teams for the HSC have solicitor, junior counsel and senior counsel. And are there any plans to stop that practice? Okay, and then just up here, yeah. <coughs> Hi, Barry Higgins is my name. I'm with the uh, Children and Family Specialist Group of the Irish Association of Social Workers. And what I'd like to ask um, is, will the necessary resources be put in place to fill vacant social work posts? Uh, many of our uh, social work uh, teams are currently working at below capacity. Um, our members are seriously concerned that we need more social workers in order to meet the necessary standards for children in care uh, and the needs of vulnerable, vulnerable children in the community. We're deeply concerned that many social workers are being overloaded at present uh, in, in the urgency to allocate cases. Um, creating an invisible waiting list in terms of um, children that they don't have the capacity to respond to uh, fully um, and also the need to fast track um, the necessary resources to recruit and support foster carers. Thank you. Okay, can we turn to the panel, maybe start with you Gordon. If... Yeah. Hey, I'll leave comment to next steps and looking at court processes to the Minister. With regards to with regards to use of counsel, of course, legal services has been run corporately within the HSC. I fully intend to disaggregate it and have it within the Child and Family Agency. I'm fully committed to de-escalation in various different ways, to increasing use of mediation. And um, you know, I, I constantly hear the bit about the use of uh, counsel in the district courts, other than if it's an issue of very great significance or in response by a local team. Now, I see you shaking your head, Catherine, so I'll be happy you know, I, 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 with this to hear examples of that, but I am restricting very, very significantly the number of people who can authorise use of counsel. So I'm publicly committed to a, a very, very uh, significant decrease in that, only when absolutely necessary, when there's a, a significant point of, of principle. 
I welcome the point made about resources because resources are there and staff are under significant pressure. You know, so I would publicly acknowledge that. I think that there is a difficulty at the moment that because as we operate increasingly as an agency within an agency accountable for our own budget which was protected by the government. But we are still caught up in the bureaucracy of the HSE. So the space with which we are filling vacancies is not acceptable. And I am championing that, I'm repeating that again and again and again, and I'm working um, in, in partnership with Impact. I want to take responsibility for our own employment control, which I should be able to do because I am responsible for a budget ceiling. And, and we will, you know, to keep within that budget ceiling, I need to be able to authorise posts, to clear posts, to get posts into teams more quickly than we are doing at present. There is also a workload uh, review which is taking place in full cooperation uh, with, the, with the trade union. I don't like the term waiting list, but I do accept under the pressure we're under, cases have got to be prioritised in terms of the most important and the most urgent. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, Connor. I think you spoke more eloquently than I could in relation to the challenge of the present approach that we're taking in courts. I mean, you gave a, a vivid picture of your experience just this week. Uh, so clearly, uh, there is work to be done. Uh, the, pres the precise you know, uh, the precise reforms that are necessary uh, clearly aren't on the table at the moment, but there is a commitment by the Minister for Justice uh, to bring in family courts that will need a referendum later this year. Um, I think family courts are one step. You know, whether within a family court system we need a specialist, you know, child and, and family uh, uh, court, I think that detail, obviously, and the whole approach that we need to take. But I think it is undoubtedly true that change is needed. And that's why I said, you know, last year was about the children's referendum. This year is about uh, the Child and Family Support Agency. But I think the whole question of how we're dealing with children within the court system is one that needs, you know, very urgent attention. I mean, there are micro uh, issues and details which can be dealt with in the meantime. But it does seem to me, and we have some, you know, very distinguished uh, members of the legal uh, of the legal profession here in this room, we have Judge Catherine McGuinness, um, whose views I, I want to hear in relation to this, for example. So um, there is work to be done. It's cross-departmental work. Uh, but I think we have to give a commitment that we are going to do things differently in relation to the way that we hear cases. Because the escalation and the adversarial nature is just simply not good enough for our children and for the future. Uh, a couple of points to make in relation to it. Uh, the work, for example, uh, that uh, Carl Coulter, who's, who's here this morning, is doing around the country, is going to be very important in informing us about what precisely is happening. I think we have been hamstrung by the fact, for very good reason, of course, that we've had the in-camera ruling, but we do need to know more about the actual practice, and we do need to... We do need to examine it, uh, pull it together, and then decide on the way forward. And, uh, you know, that work that Carl is doing, which will be uh, published in an incremental basis, will begin to give us that picture of what you describe and what, obviously, solicitors and social workers see every day. But there, I do understand that there's, you know, quite a bit of variation in what's happening. So there is serious policy work to be done in terms of a, you know, a standardised approach to, to, to those cases. And clearly the guardian ad litem system was brought in in a rather ad hoc basis. Uh, clearly one doesn't undermine or uh, understate for a moment how important uh, the guardian uh, ad litem system is and the, you know, having the voice of the, the child represented very clearly through the work of the guardian ad litem is, is clearly critical. Um, but it's unacceptable in terms of the current organisation and uh, that does require you know, policy and legislation and that, uh, that will and is being addressed. Uh, there's a, a number of issues we're examining at the moment. Um, Catherine, you raised a specific point uh, which Gordon has, has responded to. And Barry, in terms of resources, I mean, the reality is there is a budget ceiling. That is the reality. Um, we have to live within a particular budget, certainly as the economy improves and as we uh, have more resources. Of course, we want to see, and I want to see, more investment in the areas that you outline. But I do want to make the point that it is not simply about resources. It is also about doing things differently.
It is also, for example, about organisations working better together. Um, if we have more engagement between organisations, whether it's in the voluntary sector um, uh, and the statutory sector, that should ease pressure on social workers. I mean, you have to look back to the child death report and see that there were 14 professionals going into some families. You have to ask about proper risk assessment at an earlier stage. You have to look to supports for social workers. I mean, there's a whole range of issues. I do take the point, but it is simply not about calling for more resources. It is also about reform. Uh, and, you know, I do take your point in relation to vacancies and replacements, and Gordon has said Gordon does have the authority uh, to do that. But there is a budget ceiling, and, and that is the reality of the moment, and I can't change that. Uh, but as resources permit... And as the economy improves, of course, we want to see the kind of, you know, further investment that will make a difference. In terms of foster care, um, we need to recruit. I think the message has to go out that we need to recruit more foster parents. Uh, we certainly do need to do that. Uh, we can move more children from residential to foster care. We need to have more gradations, if you like, in relation to, to foster care. We can recruit parents who are willing to work with and this is already happening, to work with the more vulnerable children. Um, we are so lucky in this country to have so many foster parents compared to other countries where more ch most children are in residential care. So this is a wonderful resource that we have, and we have to support and develop it, and we have to do, and we are going to do, and uh, Gordon will be leading a recruitment campaign uh, in the spring, uh, in a few months' time. Thanks, Minister. Uh, can I, I'm going to uh, finish this session. Um, I want to... Uh, thank uh, the Minister and Gordon for being here today uh, to say to them that we are extremely heartened by their commitment to embedding a children's rights approach into the new agency and to offer them our continued support.